Social Security Award letter into um, the calculation worksheet and get a good idea of kind of where their income is, um, even if you don't do it perfectly, even if you don't, you know, poke all the right buttons the first time, that's okay. We still want to get the information in there so that um, you can start seeing where they income qualify or where they don't income qualify, more importantly. Um, Melissa has pulled up here that first tab of the calculation worksheet. And um, she had said, she had brought up with me that this tab is one of the tabs that she doesn't touch on a whole lot in training because it's not something we use a whole lot. And so to maybe speak to that a little bit, and it's true, we don't use this tab a whole lot. Um, but this would be when you have someone that um, you notice on their pay stubs, if you are a state using pay stubs, that maybe there's a couple of different kinds of bonuses listed or there's a couple of different, um, hello Isaiah, um, a couple of different random um, rates of pay that maybe you need to ask more questions about. A lot of times we may do that as a side calculation on this first tab. You would actually print this out and run a calculation on your um, adding machine. Um, Melissa, if you can go to the um, either the pay stub tab or the verification tab, either one. Um, can you scroll down? I'm not getting it to show full screen on. Um, let me try zooming out. There we go, there we go. Um, so you can see here, this is the um, employment verification calculation worksheet. And... <laughs> sorry, and, <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> and um, over here on the left side is where you would enter the information as it appears on the um, employment verification. So like their hourly rate times number of hours, um, their overtime rate times number of expected overtime hours. Um, and this you can see listed under there. This is why we don't have to use that first tab too terribly often because there are spaces here on the calculation worksheet to enter a shift differential if your verification mentions that um, to enter their tips their commissions bonuses and then there's even this little other so if they have two bonuses that's meant that are mentioned on the employment verification one can go in the bonus section one can go in the other section um, but that first tab maybe there's a third bonus or maybe they mention that there's a, um, you know, twice a year, there's a profit sharing that is paid out in cash or something random like that. Um, from looking at this, I see that, I think Missouri and Nebraska are two states that prefer the employment verification over pay stubs. Um, off the top of my head, those were the two I saw. I hate to admit it, but I did not look to see exactly what state everyone was in. Um, I know Oklahoma, Texas, um, those are definite pay stub states. The states actually prefer pay stubs. They feel like you get more information from a pay stub. But again, Missouri and Nebraska, they prefer the employment verification. So um, that's why we have the tabs for all of these things on the calculation worksheet. So um, Melissa, I had sent you a um, verification earlier. Were you able to, would you be able to pull that up so we could kind of look at that? Okay, I am looking for it. I'm sorry I didn't see it. If 
Oh no, <laughs> I should have said something earlier. I'm sorry, I didn't see it. Um, let's see. No, uh, from you or from the? Um, from me, yes. Mm, no, I didn't, I am not seeing it. Okay, well, that's all right. That is okay. Um, I had chosen one as an example simply because um, it actually had some odd but easy things that um, it was all entered. I was able to enter it all on the calculation worksheet. Oh, okay. I had to stop and think about that because. Um, Are you able to resend or? You know what? I can try. It did not want to send from this secondary office. I see. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, let me try real quick. Inbox. Thank you everyone for hanging with us. Um, probably because it never went through, Melissa. No, okay. <laughs> I was like, well, I do have some unready so, now, so I, <laughs> I wasn't entirely it is sure. It's not you. It is not you. Um, Okay, guys, we're not going to concern ourselves with this at the moment. Um, I think if I read it to you, you can get a very good idea of what, um, what I'm talking about with the calculation worksheet. So I have um, a person who's employed as a CNA. Okay, and so are we doing it based off an, an employment verification? Yes, ma'am. And yes. what name are we using for this household? Uh, Danny. Danny Smith. Okay. <laughs> so are they looking in compliance? Are they looking for a first and last name in that field? Or is it adequate to just put a last name for the household member? I, I, I find it good practice to put first and last name because if you have a husband, wife who are both working or an adult and a, and a um, like a mother and an adult child who are both working and they have the same last name. Um, I just get in the habit of using both names. Okay. Um, and I mean, and it does say household member name. It does. You're right. I just I yeah. hadn't, hadn't thought about that. Um, <laughs> in what unit number? 319. 319, okay, and is this, uh, and so we're gonna indicate here whether it's a move-in or a research. Mm -hmm. And this um, one happens to be a research. Okay. 11-25-2020, yes. Okay, That's so this is a property <laughs> that has the, the research date is on the anniversary date. Yes, we are in Texas, so okay. research date is on the anniversary date, and it is a 50% unit. Okay, all right. Okay, so according to our employment verification, um, she is at $13.08 per hour, 40 hours per week. Okay. And there's nothing to indicate that she does not work every week or isn't available to work every week. So then the total pay periods would be the 52. Okay. Um, keep in mind, everyone, this is almost always going to be the B52. Unless this is a confirmed seasonal position. But any other position, um, a lot of people will say, well, a lot of times I take two or three weeks vacation. Okay, but paid or unpaid, you're still available to work or scheduled to work 52 weeks a year. So um, when you're filling that out, don't let some of those odd side comments folks have made to you throw you off on that. It is a full-time permanent job, or it is a permanent job um, 
So typically there's going to be, it's going to be considered 52 weeks. Um, for Danny, um, they did give us an overtime rate, but they indicated zero number of hours of overtime. Um, okay. They also gave us a shift differential rate, but again, indicated zero. So there's no need to enter any of that information because the employer has clearly stated there is no overtime, there is no shift differential. This one though, they did come down and in that additional remarks line, the employer put flat rates on weekends add $1.60 per hour. So that's kind of an odd, um, an odd note that they've made. So, oh yes, we already did. Okay, thank you. Sorry, everyone. I'm also on site and my um, assistant is at lunch right now and I forgot to lock the door. <laughs> okay, so the employer indicated flat rate on weekends is an additional $1.60 per hour, but she's not on weekends yet. So I have chosen to include this. You could either include it in the shift pay or in the other. I feel that either one would be correct. Um, and it's $1 and 60 cents. And she says per hour. So weekends are Saturday, Sunday. If they, they have indicated no overtime. So Saturday, Sunday, and a, you know, an eight hour shift would be my assumption because they've indicated zero overtime. So you have two days in the weekend. So the maximum she could have would be 16 hours. And then again, we would assume 52 weekends a year. Is this clear as mud? Does it make sense? Um, is anybody wondering what the heck we got going on here? This is something that, um, and this employer actually did note that this um, resident was not yet on weekends, but this is a brand new job, which is why we're using an employment verification because it is a new job. So when they note that possibility of that additional pay on the weekends, even though they say not on weekends, she said not on weekends yet. So we would have to assume that she would be on weekends, add that in. Um, if you find that you come, you know, you have one like this and your applicant ends up being over income because of a calculation like this, please reach out to your compliance manager and ask, how much further can I clarify this? What can I call the employer and ask to see if we should really be adding that 13, that additional $1,300 or not? Because you may, you know, you may be able to clarify with the employer that no one at their facility works both Saturday and Sunday. They only schedule one day on the weekends. So that would cut that you know, in half, because then we would only be at eight hours possible maximum. Um, anything else you all can think of? Um, on this, Melissa, can you scroll down just a little bit again so I can see the bottom? Okay, so my person, because this is a brand new job, um, doesn't even have reported um, year-to-date earnings on this verification. Um, I did, however, get um, a pay stub kind of after the fact, after I had gotten the employment verification. And, um, oh, I just made that way more confusing than it needed to be. 
because we kind of look on an employment verification, you're going to use the exact year to date as it's stated on the employment verification. You don't have to think about start date versus pay date versus period end date. On your employment verification, you're just going to use the exact whatever the employer puts on the from date and the through date that appears on the employment verification. You want to click to the um, one for pay stubs. So on the pay stubs there in that year to date um, portion, that's where you really have to give some thought to um, what your pay stubs are telling you. And that's when you have to get more in depth with looking at um, what is their exact start date? And then what is their period end date or the pay date? Does everyone understand how to use this um, bottom box here, the instructions for pay stub gross year to date income calculation? Um, it states date of employment, choose the one that applies. So you're gonna look at their their application and see exactly what their start date was. The start date is, um, you're gonna enter that start date based on one of these things. If they enter 1-1, one, one, if they started working prior to the first of this year. So if, they, if their hire date per their application was in 2019, then right here on the date of employment, you would use 1-1. One, one. And then um, enter date from the last pay stub. If you look down, you're gonna correlate your A's to your B's to your C's. So if they started working prior to the first of the year and you've entered 1-1, one, one, then you're gonna drop down to A on what second date you're gonna use and you'll use the paycheck date. So the actual pay date will be what you enter for the um, enter date from the last pay stub. And then the same would go for enter their actual start date if they started. So if they were hired 415 of 2020, they did not start working prior to 1 1 of this year. So you would enter 415 2020 in date of employment. And then in um, B, you would follow those directions and enter the pay period end date because that's going to catch exactly um, the dates worked because they've only worked within this year. Okay, Bill is at Lark. For applicants that only have social security income, which one should we use to fill out their information for social security and COLA increases? Oh, the employment verification or the pay stub. You know what, it doesn't matter because that information at the top is the same regardless of which one you're on. Our, our social security is the same on either one. So you can, it doesn't matter which one you use. Um, are you guys comfortable with how to enter the social security increase, the COLA increase? Um, I will tell you one thing, and it took me literally, when we first started using these calculation worksheets, it took me probably 30 days to figure out that um, you need to be very, very sure that you enter the correct move-in date or the correct anticipated move-in date um, or the correct research date so that your social security increase um, calculates correctly because it's assuming 
like let's pretend I had said this was a resort. Let's pretend that she is a new move in, slated to move in 1125. So it's going to assume how much, um, how many Social Security payments she'll get at the old rate based on that 1125 move in date. Um, whereas if we put, like it's going to assume, I believe, two payments at the old rate. Um, Melissa, we could kind of just fake one in here. Absolutely. Okay, so see, since this is thinking she's moving in November 25th, it's giving us um, two months. Oh. <laughs> that was a test for you too. <laughs> right? You should, I, I had no words for a moment. I had no words. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so with Melissa putting in that we're expecting her to move in, 1125 of 2020 her new social security rate is effective 1 1 of 2021 um, that's going to give her two months at the current rate of 500 and then 10 months at the new rate of i think it's 100 or 508 is maybe what that new rate calculates to um, yes, because it's 5,080. Um, in the grand scheme of things, most of most of the time, you know, that's not going to be enough difference. The you know the unfortunately the cost of living allowance is um, not a huge increase for our seniors. But if they if you are working with someone who is right on the cusp going from one income restriction to the next, getting this entered correctly, um, the, you know, the first time they come in to talk to you will definitely, um, you know, it could make a difference of them uh, qualifying, say, at the 50% income restriction versus them having to go to the 60% income restriction. And like, I don't know about you guys, but like with my, um, some of my units that 50% to 60% is like $150 difference in rent. So we definitely want to make sure that we utilize that move-in date correctly, get our increases in there correctly, our in our um, effective date in there, <laughs> and um, so that we know for sure where they qualify, and then understand that as their move-in date changes, if it happens to change, um, you would need to change that move-in research due date because it will affect their income when we're dealing with an increase. Um, some of you on the lease-ups, I mean, I can't, th there's no way to put into words how many times your people's move-in dates have changed as we've had delay, you know, different delays or just hitting crunch time and trying to move in 10 people a day a lot of people get bumped to the next day so you need to make sure you're keeping up on that move-in research date on your um, calculation worksheets and that's somewhere that you can actually help compliance make sure they are keeping up on it if there's anything on here that is affected by that date such as an increase okay does anyone have any other questions or any thoughts um, if you don't have any questions you want to ask right now, but um, I don't know about you, but I'm that person that 15 minutes after this is over, I'll be like, but what about, what about, um, feel free to, you know, email Melissa or myself and we'll definitely, you know, go back over things. And Melissa is recording this um, for a couple of the managers who were out today. So um, she could always let you, you know, give you access where you could listen to it again. But if it's just a question that we didn't cover, be sure to you know email and ask because I know the calculation worksheets. That's a lot. 
there's a lot of info, there's a lot of questions that could be asked and a lot of different things we could go over. Okay, if y'all don't have anything else on this, then Melissa, we can move on to, I don't remember what's next. PFNs, um, that was another really good question that came up um, that was sent to Melissa, just kind of talking through PFNs. Um, the PFN is the pending file notice, so that's what comes back from your compliance specialist. When you upload a file into Case Manager, when you hit submit, it says submission may take a few minutes, and then all of a sudden it pops up and tells you, you know, this has been assigned to Kay Hansen or Catherine McCauley or whoever. Um, once they have reviewed the file, then they're going to send you back this PFN, um, sometimes long ones, sometimes short ones, um, just kind of depends. I know everyone has pretty mixed feelings on pinning file notices. I can tell you working on site right now, I don't like them. <laughs> I don't like getting that back because I know that means that they saw something I didn't see or they just disagree with how something is calculated. And that's okay because what I want all of you to think about for the pending file notice, there's two things. First of all, think of it as um, one of the best learning tools because you are new. Um, by reading and truly reading your pending file notices and looking back at the files, that is the best learning tool that there is in compliance as far as I'm concerned. Um, because you start noticing, you'll notice patterns in your own behavior. Oh, I always forget the student status or she constantly tells me, you know, that I have someone marked as a full-time student and he's only three. What am I doing wrong? You know, it's like I said, it's the best way to see what you personally are missing or maybe misinterpreting over and over. And um, the second thing is it's a great way to open dialogue between you and a specialist. Um, to me, I look at a pending file notice as the start of a conversation. You know, if what I read that came from the specialist does not um, necessarily make sense or doesn't, um, I'm not sure why they're asking me that or why they're telling me to do that. This isn't something for you to say, oh, I did all of these things wrong. No, this is something for you to say, oh, I need to either reply via email or pick up the phone and call this person and say, can you give me better explanation of this? Or I didn't even know I was supposed to look at that. Can you further explain what that is? So on this one, um, from looking at it, this was most um, definitely a, well, it's an AEC. That's what the, um, it's an annual eligibility certification. That's what they're called in Texas when you're allowed to do just the one page self certification. Um, Kansas, Missouri, most everyone allows it after, at least maybe after a first full year recert. Um, but some of you may be looking at this saying, there's lease corrections and cert corrections, like I'm kind of confused. It's because it's a self-cert. Um, and when doing a self-cert, instead of a full recertification, you do complete the certification and the lease at the same time. So your PFN will come back with both certification corrections and lease corrections. Whereas on your typical new move-in, or not on your typical, on any new move-in, as well as a full re recertification, your pending file notice would only come back with file corrections. 
So on this one, um, your, your pending file notices typically, they're gonna be numbered just like this, and it should start at the beginning of the paperwork and work your way back. So like this one, number one, every comment that they've made or direction that they've given refers to the very first page, the annual eligibility cert. So the direction to me on this one is very clear. You've On this one, we've had a minor who's turned 18. Um, so the specialist is giving direction. Um, because he has now turned 18, we need the following information and we would need him to sign the cert, the lease and all addendums. Um, then number two is giving, referencing still that same household member, those are um, one site corrections. Make Daniel an adult co-head and occupant and lease signer and non-student. <laughs> this one had a lot going on in one site because he's no longer a student. So we would want to correct that um, so that the one site information stays correct and in line with the annual eligibility cert. Um, their next one, their next point has gone back to the cert and um, this was something I was referencing and it's something that um, y'all may struggle with is when is a person a full-time student? I know every one of my applicants wants to make their four-year-old a full-time student because they go to preschool full-time. So just keep in mind, that's what this is referencing. It's only K through 12 or um, institutions of higher learning that are considered full-time students. If he is only three, then I'm fairly certain that this should be no. He would not be a full-time student. And as always, any correction, make sure they correct and the resident and or applicant initials, any correction that they make. Um, the pending file notice. So like this one I'm noticing, like I said, it kind of starts with the beginning of the file and works it works its way back from the file into one site and now the lease. So um, hopefully your pending file notices will always be broken down like that or in a similar fashion that's very easy to follow. And just remember to, for your own sake, also break it down like that. You know, don't don't look up and see seven, eight, twelve things on there and let it become a thing. Um, break it down to what um, what are they referring to, and just take it one piece at a time. So Melissa has asked a question to everyone. What are your, you know, do you have any trouble understanding your PFNs? Um, do you have a specific struggle that comes back with your PFNs? Hmm, that's a good one. Are you usually able to get corrections turned in within 72 hours? <laughs> um, I'm hoping at least a couple of you say no because I just had a file that um, I don't even, I, I can't even calculate how many hours it was because it went into days upon days upon days before I could make contact with the resident to um, get the correction back. Um, COVID did not help that situation, um, but when you're dealing with a resident or applicant who is employed and they have kids and the kids are in softball or you know football or whatever the season is, um, you know, it can be hard to get them to come back by. Sometimes it's hard to get them to even answer their phone during your office hours. Um, I've had applicants that I know I personally have had to stay after hours 
um, you know, maybe just 20, 30 minutes to meet with them because otherwise, you know, I would have, it just doesn't work with their work schedule. Um, Villas at Lark. So in case y'all don't know, Villas at Lark is a um, senior property. So yes, it would very much depend on her, on the applicants, since a lot of them are not employed, but um, and if you ever have a PFN that just doesn't make sense, don't, do not stress yourself out over it and don't waste a ton of your time trying to understand it. Pick up the phone and call or shoot an email, you know, right back, reply on that PFN and say, can you please call me? Some of this doesn't, I'm, I don't understand part of this. Um, as a property manager, your time is very valuable. You're pulled, you know, you have so many other things to do besides compliance that while I want you to understand it, I want you to love it, you're probably not ever going to, but you might. <laughs> but don't, don't, don't let it take more of your time than it should. Um, immediate you know read it read it through a couple of times and if you just truly if, if it's just not clicking and not making sense shoot an email real quick and you know and just ask for um them to call you when they can or yes great point melissa um hannah is fantastic hannah on the help desk um i've actually called her from my property um to get some insight on where to look for some things that I wasn't sure, you know, where my resources were. So, okay, if you all don't have, do you have any more comments, questions, um, anything about PFNs? <laughs> yes, Lisa Hanna is a savior. Yeah. Oh, and I don't know if any of you all know this or not, but um, Hannah actually started out in the compliance department. Um, she was a specialist for, um, I don't even know, a year and a half probably. And um, so she has worked every type of file there is personally. Like she personally has gone start to finish on every type of file that there is. So she not only still sits, you know, in the same general area as the compliance group, but she also has personal firsthand knowledge of working those files. So yes, please use Hannah as a great resource. Okay, the last question that was sent in was um, applications from a married couple. And it came in specifically, which totally made sense, from um, a manager of a, <laughs> of a um, senior property. And unfortunately, it's true that most of our applicants on a senior property are single. Um, whether, you know, widowed or divorced or whatever, but um, she had made the comment that she had her first application for a married couple and it really threw her for a loop. And it can, when you're used to um, completing single person applications, um, two people in front of you kind of makes you blah, 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 you know, what do I do with this? Um, the good thing is it's not um it's not really too terribly different um a married couple will complete one application and then both sign pages four and five so everything on that application is going to refer to both people in the household um, it does not matter who you make head of household or who they make head of household. It doesn't matter. They just, whoever they start with is who they start with. 
Um, and then every question on there refers to both of them. So that's the only thing, just kind of watch as they're filling everything out. Um, here's where they will get tripped up. So husband is filling out the application. Oh, who am I kidding? Wife is filling out the application. I don't think I've ever had a husband fill out an application. Wife is filling out the application and um, doesn't matter. She lists herself first and then the husband and you get to the are you employed question. She wants to answer it no because she does stay home and um, does not work outside of the home, but the husband does. So that's the only thing that can be confusing about a married couple on one application. It says, are you employed? it means are you as in anyone in the household employed so even though she's the one filling it out she would mark that yes and then under income sources she would list you know his name his employer start date etc and then yes like it says both husband and wife sign um the page four of the application uh, married couples pay one application fee, but they do get screened separately. Everyone is always screened separately. You never screen two people at one time. So whenever you hit that screen now, it should just have one person checkmarked, but you enter the entire household income, just like you do on roommates or anything else. Um, all household members, income and assets information will get verified, yes. So make sure that, again, we kind of go back to the wife wanting to answer no because it says, are you employed? It's not what she has, it's what they collectively have. So whether it's his, whether it's hers, or whether it's theirs, all should be listed and all would be verified. Um, when an asset has multiple owners, who owns it? So again, it's kind of like the head of household. It doesn't matter who's listed. If it is their checking account, as in the husband and wife or the husband and husband or the wife and wife that are on the application, doesn't matter which one of them we list as the quote unquote owner um, because it is a household asset. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and a lot of times people or, you know, applicants will be like, I mean, that's really his checking. Okay, that's okay. You know, like if, if it makes them feel better for you to put it under the husband's name, okay. If it makes them feel better, put it, you know, under her name, okay. It doesn't, you know, it does not matter if both names are on the account. I just kind of tell people pick one, you know, it, it truly does not matter. Um, the other thing to remember is, um, if a couple come in and state that they're married, then we pull out one application. Um, we do not pull out two separate applications. So, you know, it doesn't matter if, um, it, it used to trip everyone up when, you know, there were different last names or, um, you know, same sex couples. I feel like it's becoming more commonplace where we're, we're not as wanting to question people. But again, the rule of thumb, if they walk in and state, you know, that we're, we're married, we just got married, we're looking for a new home, or um, I just always ask people, we do separate applications for um, single individuals, we do one application for a married couple, and I just let them tell me at that point. Um, 
anything else anyone can think of on applications for married folks? Okay, well, that is about all that I have. So what, are there any questions you all have right now um, regarding PFNs or calculation worksheets? Um, anything we've gone over today or for that matter kind of anything else that has maybe popped into your head as we've been talking because if somebody doesn't have a question i'm just going to sit here and talk nervously for a couple of minutes and that's never a good idea <laughs> <laughs> melissa knows that's her cue too. <laughs> too, funny. too funny we do have a question okay. Yes, separated spouses, if they are not legally separated, how do, you, how do you approach it? So on the marital separation affidavit, and if I'm, if I'm wrong, y'all can correct me because I'm going off memory. Um, number one, I believe says I am married, but, current, but legally separated. And then in parentheses or in um, quotation marks, it said, or no, parentheses, I was right the first time, parentheses, it says attach legal documentation. <clears throat> so if they are legally separated, that means they have like a pending divorce or they have an actual legal separation document that came from the courts, just like a divorce decree will eventually. Um, boom, number one, there you go, guys. I remember some things. Um, let me get bigger so my old eyes can see it. Okay. Um, so like I, Jennifer York, really state that I am legally separated from Barney Fife and have attached a copy of my current legal separation agreement. So I would proceed to the bottom, I would sign and date it, and I would hand you a complete copy of my legal separation agreement. Most of our folks, because legal separations are almost a thing of the past in a whole lot of states, um, most of our folks are gonna mark that next one. I, Jennifer York, duly state that I am currently separated from Barney Fife, but I've not taken legal action with regard to my marital status. <clears throat> so then I must move down and answer numbers one, two, and three. So the first question, my reason for not currently pursuing legal action. Everything in tax credit your income limits, um, your occupancy, everything is based on who is in this household. Um, when we calculate income, it's who is in this household. If a, if a couple are separated with intent to divorce or intent to forever live separately, then we don't have to worry about the income or the assets of that other person. If a couple are separated by distance, but we're truly still married with no intent to divorce or end our relationship, Barney Fife and I were separated by distance for eight years because he traveled literally 50 weeks a year. And I've had people come in who are in that situation and they want to say, but my husband's not going to live here. Okay, but you are truly married. You share bank accounts. You share income. You share everything. He just happens to travel a lot. Um, that's why you will notice your compliance people will say if they're not, they have to state the intent to either divorce or forever live separate. 
It's not because we care about religious beliefs or whether they're married, divorced, or you know, a polygamist with 42 wives. What we care about is whose income do we have to count and whose income do we not have to count. So number one, my reasons for not currently pursuing legal action are if I'm truly have the intent to live forever separate, my reasoning right there might be um, newly separated, have to save up money. Or I've had people write newly separated, emotionally not stable enough to pursue. Um, find out what their truth is, you know, talk to them. And that's that's what would go in there. What is their true current reason for not pursuing legal action? I've had folks write, um, my reasons for not currently pursuing legal action are, I do not believe in divorce. To again, totally fine. I'm not concerned about their you know, religious beliefs. It's about who is gonna be part of this household, whose income do we have to count? Now, they may have to add more to that of, I do not believe in divorced, divorce, however, I will not ever allow my spouse to be part of my household, something like that. Um, my future plans for pursuing legal action are, in a typical situation, they would answer that something like, um, pursue divorce and or other legal action in the future after saving up money. Um, my future plans for pursuing legal action are, um, he will be hiring a lawyer, I'm waiting to hear from them. Um, future plans for pursuing legal action. I'm going to open a child support case through the state and we will proceed with divorce after we've saved up money, after more time has passed, whatever. Number three, this next one, I currently receive blank for blank from my spouse. So that's where, um, if they're receiving child support from this person they're separated from, um, and we already know about it, they need to put that on there. Sometimes they haven't told us about it, and this is where we find out about it. Um, any monies that they're receiving from their spouse should be listed there. Okay, Lisa, does that kind of take care of your question? Do you have? Um, Anything more specific on that that you wanted to know? Okay, does anyone else have any comment or want to weigh in on um, separations? Okay, good. I'm glad that helped. Separations can be um, rough sometimes, especially when you're dealing, because you're dealing with people's emotions, as if it's like a recent and um happening and that can get you know even more dicey <laughs> okay melissa i don't know if you want to wrap up um and then we're um yes if anyone else has anything like i said feel free to reach out to send melissa an email shoot me an email um because we would love to help everyone out as much as possible, um, starting during COVID and with our lovely happy-go-lucky trainer out. I know, I, you know, I don't know how much one-on-one -on -one you've had, so. Yeah, they certainly were, um, they, they missed a little bit of action with, <laughs> with their, <laughs> um, their start dates. And um, we would, we really, really want to, want to try to help that. And i um, so thankful that you had time to uh, cover this compliance call with us, Jennifer, there, you have so much to offer. And, um, oh, we do have another question that popped up. 
and um, just in time too, before we let her off the call. <laughs> right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, okay. so, Melissa, if you will definitely pull up a self-employment affidavit because I, I know that. they just updated it. <laughs> okay. Yes, they did, didn't they? Yeah. I don't think I've even looked at it. I mean, I looked at it when they sent it out, but I haven't had need to use it yet. So. That's a great question, or that's probably a great question today. I may be like, uh, the, the. And today is in Georgia. I don't think there's a specific state self-affidata for Georgia. No, no, there's not. See, if I show you the entire okay. form, then it becomes less visible. So just, I'll, I'll just show it above, you know, where the content is. Right, right. Okay. Today, do you have a specific question? Is there something specific or do you want me to just kind of start at the top and go through the form? Um, I'll kind of begin by starting at the top, but if you have a specific question, jump in, you know, don't be afraid to type it in here. Um, so a self-employment affidavit, this is gonna be anyone who Comes in stating, hey, I mow lawns for a living and I do this for myself. I don't work for anyone else. Or I'm a cosmetologist or I'm, um, I do nails. Those are some kind of common um, self-employed individuals. Or you may find, um, I've had a lot of people who work for um, like small construction companies that you know, you ask for their pay stubs so you can kind of get an idea of their income and you look at it and you're like, oh, I don't see taxes being taken out. So someone who is a 1099 employee is also considered self-employed, even though they don't technically own their own business, they are a 1099 employee and they have to file self-employed um, at the end of the year on their tax return. Isn't like um, Uber drivers part of this as well? Wouldn't oh, self affidavit? Yes. yes. <laughs> Uber, um, Lyft, all of those. Um, so the self employment affidavit itself, um, at the top, you're going to have the household name, which, um, you know, that may be if Danny Smith is. Um, the head of household, apartment 319. The self-employed individual may be Danny. It might be his, um, you know, roommate, who's his cousin, Donnie. Um, it might be his wife, who's a cosmetologist down the street. Um, the business name, typically if they're a 1099 employee, they don't have a business name. You know, they're like, but I don't have a true business name their name is totally fine to go in there. Um, the business type, again, cosmetologist, lawn care, um, housekeeping, Uber, Lyft, any of that. The street address, especially if they're a 1099 employee, would be their address, whatever their home address is, um, or an Uber driver or a Lyft driver. They don't have a place that they go, that they conduct business out of they you know, use their vehicle. So the address, all of that is their own. Cosmetologist would use you know, where they do business. The date started is the big thing. As they're filling this out, just cross your fingers and hope for all the good juju that they're gonna put like three or four years ago. Because if they put 2017, you're gonna say, thank goodness, bring your last two years tax returns and let's fill this out. Um, that's possibly the most important part is using, if, if they have been in business the previous year, the full previous year and before, using the correct income from the most recent tax return. It's that very first line, income earned from most recent tax return. You are not gonna look at um, all of the income because if it's a married couple, you know, they're gonna have, you know, the wife's W-2 wages from Walmart 
as well as the husband's lawn care um, self-employment wages. You're going to pull the Schedule C, and it is the one time in compliance in tax credit that we get to use the net income. So um, it doesn't matter if he grossed $125,000 last year, if he had expenses that break that down to where his net is 22,000, that's what we count. Because the net income on self-employment is what he actually brought home after taking care of his expenses. Um, the requirements vary by state. <clears throat> That is sedacious. <laughs> that that is exactly what I was getting ready to get into, um, and I'm glad you asked that question because that'll kind of keep me in line of everything I wanted to say. So, a profit and loss, you can get all fancy and do it on an Excel spreadsheet. Your applicant may already have that, like he may be that guy and he keeps it on his laptop and he can just open his laptop and hit um, print and give you this fantastic excel spreadsheet that shows all this crazy stuff um, most people that we work with do not have that um, if they say oh my gosh i don't have that like all i have are um, you know, these receipts showing what I've been paid, what I've made so far this year, and then the shoebox of receipts. I would immediately reach out to your compliance manager and say, here's what my person has. They just started the business. We're gonna say they just started the business this year in 2020. Here's what they have can you send me in a direction what do i need to you know what do i need to do i can tell you now but when this actually is comes in front of you i still say stop call your compliance manager and just break it down or send an email break it down here is exactly what my person has please talk me through exactly what we need to do. You don't want them making 13 trips. Um, they don't want to make 13 trips back and forth from your office, bring, you know, bits and pieces information. Um, so have that conversation with your compliance manager when you're actually in the situation. But I will tell you now, if they have a full year tax return, so we are in November of 2020 and my person comes in and applies and they put date started December of 2018. As long as they filed 2019's taxes, I have a full year tax return. I don't need a profit loss don't have to gather that extra information. Um, Missouri people, I hate to tell you, um, you have to have two full years. Melissa, can you scroll down so I can see that bottom part? I'm gonna cheat. It says it right here, guys. Um, Missouri and Mississippi applicants must provide tax returns for the most recent two years. And Nebraska, <laughs> it's three years. Um, I knew Nebraska had some extra requirements. I was hoping it was that maybe they had loosened up, but they haven't. It is, <laughs> yes, wow. Nebraska is making sure these people qualify. But again, that's only if they've been in, there in business for three years. Only if the business has been in place for three years. So, Missouri and Mississippi, it's two years. 
Assuming the business has been around for more than two years, Nebraska, it's three years. Everyone else, it is just one full year. Now, unfortunately, I keep saying that over and over, full year. It must be one full year and they must have a filed tax return. So think about it, we're in November of 2020. My guy comes in and he says, oh, I started my business November of 2019. And you're like, woohoo, you've been business a full year. Mm -mm. He doesn't have a full year tax return. All he has is 2019's tax return that is November and December of 2019. And then you're gonna have to do an 11 month profit loss for 2020, which let's hope that doesn't happen because with COVID, who knows what kind of information these poor people are gonna have. But, um, so let's pretend we have a full year tax return. We've pulled information from the Schedule C that says the income earned from the most recent tax return was $18,022. Um, the anticipated income next 12 months. If they sit here and tell you, well, I have been a little bit busier and I truly believe I'm going to be at 21,000, you know, over the next 12 months. We're going from 18,000 to 21,000. That is completely um, sensible. You know, I don't even, I don't have a calculator in front of me, so I can't say what percentage increase that is, but that's a very small percentage increase. Completely makes sense that someone could build their business from 18,000 to 21,000. And um, I believe it's any, like a $2,500 difference is where we question. Um, and I may have to check with the compliance managers to see if that's correct. I could be making that number up. But even if someone questions it, all your person, you know, the only explanation would be that would be required would be like if it's a nail tech, they would just say, um, I've got more regular customers this year than I did last year. So I anticipate a little bit of an increase. Um, if they say, if, you know, again, if they anticipate a small decrease, that's okay too. And it would be a similar, you know, just a, a short explanation of I'm not um, working as many hours at my, at my business because I'm, my kids are doing virtual school and I have to devote more time to that. Um, I can't think without trying to address every individual <laughs> situation there might be, that's kind of my general um, thoughts on a self-employed affidavit. Um, today, is there anything else that, um, anything specific that you wanted covered? The, um, okay, good. Um, self-employment, if someone has a tax return, the required number of tax returns, self-employment's not too bad. Um, when they don't or when they bring in, you know, you're in Missouri, they bring in two years tax returns and one of them shows a net profit of $65,000 and then they're like, oh, but I'm not going to do that anymore. That's when self-employment starts getting kind of dicey. Um, and again, remember your compliance managers when those situations happen. Um, you can always reach out to me and I don't care to help, especially with um, like doing a profit loss, but um, don't let it, don't let it be bigger than it is. A lot of times they're, you know, keeping it simple is the key to um, a successful self-employment application. Okay, I don't have anything else if y'all don't. Thank you, Jennifer. That was, um, I think, really helpful to the group. And thank you. Thank you for the, also to the guys with the questions. 
we're ladies specifically. <laughs> the ones For sure. We're ladies. Um, and because we all grow and learn together when we can, you know, ask questions and, and review them. So I think it was a really good thing. And I am recording this webinar. So anybody who wants a copy of the recording, I'm not going to publish it on, uh, on ERP or anything, but if you want a copy of it, I'll just have an unlisted uh, YouTube link that I can send you if you're interested. I can also send you a copy of the uh, PowerPoint presentation, but it doesn't actually have that much information in it. Um, there was just a few items over what we um, were looking at. So it, yeah, uh, Melissa. Yes. This is Peggy uh, Chittam. Uh, yeah, send me the link because I've been interrupted 15,000 times since I sat down to watch this. I understand 100%. I've been on site. Jennifer's on site. We've all, we've all been there. So I will <laughs> happily send that to you so you can rewind and fast forward to the parts that you didn't get to hear. Um, okay. So I will do that. Thank you guys. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear us today. Um, felt like this was helpful. So that is good to hear. And also, you know, if you guys have any requests for future training or anything else that you just want to take a little time for us to go over with you, please um, feel free to reach out. If not, I, I think we might just coordinate one for maybe later in December if we can all get an agreeable date together um, and just kind of reconnect and see what questions come up between now and then. Okay. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Sade, and always thank you, Melissa. Ah, you're welcome. <laughs> I really didn't do much, but uh, <laughs> this was all you, but thank you for that. This has been a good one. Okay, well, um, with that said, um, thank you guys all for your time and attention. I'm sorry we went over slightly over an hour, but um, hopefully, um, you know, it was to everyone's benefit, and uh, have a great rest of your day and great week, and Enjoy your Thanksgiving uh, next week. I can't Woo believe it's here already. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Take care, guys.